Hello, folks. It's uh, the second part of it Italy Week here on World War II TV. And um, if you were with me last night, we did the Folgore show. In fact, we ended up doing two because our first one was stopped. We had to start a second one during the first one, which is the first for World War II TV. But that was really cool talking to my old mate, Neil, about Italian paratroops. Um, today, we are talking about Indian armoured reconnaissance, cavalry, armored car units, whatever you want to call it. It's a, it's a subject that we were just discussing hasn't been talked about very much before, which therefore makes it pretty interesting. So joining me again, he was with us in Tank Week, Gareth Davies. Good evening, Gareth. How are you doing? Evening, Apart from the fact you're cold, aren't you? Your so windows again, are open. Yeah, I'm freezing here because I have my windows painted. So they're, they're all open at the moment, but I'm sure we'll manage. So when I put the feelers out for doing something Italy based, and you came back with Woody. What about if I do Indian rec recce regiments? <laughs> what was your rationale behind that? May I ask? Well, there, there, there is a bit of method in the madness, and there's a little bit of recycling something I've done before. Um, back in December uh, last year, late November, I got uh, an email from um, the defense attache in um, the British High Commission in Delhi saying, Gareth, did tanks work with um did rtr tanks work with uh, indian uh, soldiers in italy in the second world war i said well a little bit why oh can you can you get it together in a story for the chandigarh military literature festival and i said possibly but it might be stretching let me go away and have a think and then a few days later the deputy military actually um emailed saying we thought about looking at recce and i said no, I haven't. Let, let's give it a go. And so I ended up having a look at the, the three recce regiments and um, gave my talk on on that um, back in December, which was an amazing, um, amazing event. I mean, the Chandrigar Military Literary Festival, three days, um, predominantly Indian based um, military historians speaking about a wide range of, of, of subjects. Some of it is about uh, the Indian, uh, I mean, it's it, it's history, military history and military current affairs. They were talking about the the, the Indian nuclear deterrent uh, an hour before we came on. And then there were four of us talking about uh, the Indian army in Italy in the Second World War. And it felt a bit self-conscious that we were all four white men, all based in the UK, um, talking about Indians in Italy. But um, um, it was good fun. And so that's where my background to this came from. Um, and, and there's just not much out there. And I didn't really know much about it, uh, Woody. So, um, and, and it's an interesting setup with um, recce regiment. I mean, there's not much written about recce. There's not much written about how they went about their business. There's a little bit about the reconnaissance corps out there, Paul, uh, uh, Richard Doherty's book and a few other bits and pieces. Um, there's divisional histories um, all over the place, which, of course, talk about their um uh, their, their recce regiments, but recce regiments for an infantry division have generally come from outside of that division. Well, no, generally it's a bit unfair, but quite a lot of them come from outside the division. And um, how they came into being, they've all come through different routes. And the, the, the three Indian ones, they're cavalry regiments. These are mounted regiments that convert to the mechanised role, gosh, in the late 30s. I'm 38, I think, the Indian cavalry start... Um, converting to the mechanised role, Sin Source, I think, are one of the first. And so in 1939, and I'm going to stretch it here to any, and 1940, but I'm willing to be wrong on that last point, the Indian cavalry are still convert, still mechanising. And um, it's therefore pretty amazing that a year or two later, well, three years later by the time they get to Italy, that these Indian cavalry regiments are um, doing mounted and dismounted reconnaissance in a whole range of vehicles, which we'll look at in a minute. And so... Um, I find it fascinating from an organisational point of view. I find it fascinating from the, 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 the equipment point of view. And a little bit of me, but I have no proof for this, uh, with my mounted reconnaissance background, that's what I saying. It says that the reconnaissance officer, a, a mounted soldier from a cavalry regiment, cavalry, part of the role was reconnaissance, comes to the role better than a, a an infantry battalion that's being re-rolled. I have no proof. That's just um, pure... <laughs> Mounted arrogance from me, um, absolutely no proof whatsoever. And again, you know, how could you measure their effectiveness? It'd be a ridiculous uh, thing to do, other than for 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 pride. And so um, that's how I came to be um, looking at Indian cavalry in Italy and the three regiments. There's just three regiments. Yeah. 
I mean, in general, I mean, for the Americans watching particularly and, and non-Brits, the, the, ver the various protagonists in World War II looked at reconnaissance in different ways. Where, where armoured divisions, you could say there's a broad sweeping similarity between a German, British and an American and Canadian armoured division, more or less. Yeah. But with regards to reconnaissance, it gets a bit vague and what vehicles you use. And the reconnaissance corps in terms of the British Army is the shortest history regiment ever, is it? 41. And by 45, 40, even by 44, they've been absorbed into the RAC. And then it, yes. it ceases to exist in 46 completely. So it's it's five years. So it was it a short-lived experiment. It, it is a short-lived experiment. What is interesting, that the Queen's Dragoon Guards, the first the Queen's Dragoon Guards, now you know, all British Army regiments have a, a thing called a tactical recognition flash on their blimey, can't remember which sleeve it goes now. Um, the QDG, first Queen's Dragoon Guards, they have the, the Christmas tree, um, the Ricky, Div, uh, Ricky called Christmas tree as their tactical recognition flash on, the, on a blue background, which is their regimental colour. Um, so the, 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 it's kept alive a little bit. That's a relatively recent thing. I mean, in the last 10 years, I guess, about 10 to 15 years that it came back in. Um, so it is sort of out there, but you're absolutely right. Um, reconnaissance Corps, a, a bunch of odds and sods, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. Um, some regiments that come into it come from the Armoured Corps, a few. Some are infantry battalions re-rolled who have, have literally been just TA regiments. Um, and some are, certainly some of the jocks do it, because I got into a discussion with somebody recently about it. Um, the certainly 52nd um, Highland, uh, Lowland Division, they are the, brig sorry, the divisional, the brigade, sorry, the brigade anti-tank companies that lose that role. They're brought, the three companies brought together, formed into a, a, a battalion or a regiment, um, and they become the recce regiment. So, they were not only re-rolling and re-equip, they were re-rolling and re-equipping, whereas I, I think in the Indian Army's favour, they were less re-rolling because reconnaissance, divisional reconnaissance, was one of their roles, albeit they used to do it on horses. Now they're doing it on um, these things. What are those? Those are Humbers, aren't they? Yes. Humbers, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, so folks, we, we when we did our pre-show chat half an hour ago, 20 minutes ago, we, we, we said... We are open to people contributing uh, information to this because <laughs> it's, a, it's a subject that, there, as, as Gareth said, there isn't a huge amount out there written down. If people have information, I mean, I'm a bit more about, I know a bit more about the kit because I've played around with armor cars in the past. And so I know about a little bit about how they drive and how they perform, but I don't know as much about their role. Um, and I don't think the British Army, I mean, going down a rabbit hole immediately, knows necessarily how to use reconnaissance troops. I mean, thinking about in the first airborne Re Re reconnaissance squadron, for example, I know it's another tangent, Arnhem, yeah. but yeah, everyone knows about the jeeps there. But they're being used in a, in an armoured, aggressive way, which has nothing to do with reconnaissance. So, in 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 a fam famous deployment of reconnaissance troops, that I would argue they're not even being used in what is what should be a traditional reconnaissance role. I mean, they're armed jeeps going on. So there's a precedent, I think, in World War II for a, a misuse deliberately and sometimes just accidentally and just through a lack of experience of what exactly is expected of a reconnaissance unit. So within Italy, within the Indian, when, when you know, you said they come from cavalry, do we know what, what was written down about what was expected of these, right? Because you're going to talk about how they get to Italy first and how they form, but was there a... Did the Indian Army say, "Why right, we need a force that can do this," or did you know? Did they fit a force to the role or a role to the force? I, I, I think the role and the force existed before because um, your your comments about um, recce squadrons at Arnhem not doing recce but doing more of a strike. The term I would use is cavalry, and and this to yeah. me is what cavalry are. And uh, I was in the Royal Tank Regiment, and there's a great rivalry between us, the men in black and the, 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 the cavalry. Um, and, and we are different in terms of where we've come from. And the RTR today has a tradition, which I've spoken about on a number of other platforms, of, of, of heavy armour, has come through the infantry tank route and is now a Challenger 2 Regiment, and will be a Challenger 3 Regiment. Um, cavalry regiments are the reconnaissance regiments we have in the British Army are, 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 are cavalry regiments. I think we should use that term, cavalry, because it, it covers that that the, the range of time. I used four um, tasks, gain, deny, deceive, exploit. There are others. That's just a, a snappy little um, thing I picked up, gosh, 20 years ago from, from somebody cleverer than me. 
gain it. That's the recce bit, gain information, deny. So the screening task, you can't, they can't dig in and defend an area, but they can do a bit of denial, gain, den gain deny, deceive. Deception plan, if you've got people and vehicles who are, who are perhaps a little bit more experienced, a little bit used to being out on their own, they can go out and do deception tasks. So what's the form? Gain, deceive, dis uh, exploit. Cav classic cavalry uh, role. We tried to do it in, 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 in 1917, well, 1916, 17, and 18. Um, and we are absolutely exploiting throughout North Africa at times. Um, we've done it at the back end of, well, 1940 after um, Crusader. Uh, and then as we're pushing west, there's a lot of exploitation going on there. Quick, right move now. Um, so, yeah, I think cavalry. And so I think the divisional cavalry regiment is something that, that, that would have existed as we call it, the Divisional Reconnaissance Regiment. So I think the Indian Army, and I'm, again, very, very happy to be proven completely wrong on this, I think the Indian concept of the, the Divisional Cavalry Regiment was perhaps more in the mindset than it was with some of the, the, the British regiments. Um, as you say, armoured divs, I can bore for Britain on my understanding of British infantry divisions in the sort of late 30s, early, and the development of them, they're... they're, they're whole raison d'etre doctrine and, 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 and role I'm less aware of. So cavalry, I think, is the, 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 the right word. The role that they're put into the division is predominantly as a reconnaissance regiment. Yeah. yeah. So can. already it kind of gets into the terminology and, and, and slightly confusing and conflicting sometimes. And it, but it's, yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll progress. And you've, as, as with all my guests and yourself previously, you've provided us some PowerPoint images. There isn't yeah. a huge, there aren't lots and lots, folks, because there aren't that many fo photos. But um, so they're, they're, the Indians, Indian units that fought in Italy had come from other places first. So, so to, the, the units you're going to talk about are, 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 are these. Yes. Okay. So sixth Lancers, sixth Duke of Connaught's own Lancers, the Central Indian ho India Horse and Skinner's Horse. And um, again, this is not my area of expertise, the makeup of the Indian Army, but I find it fascinating. Um, and what is interesting, what I would really like to, to get into later, it, not, not, in, not tonight, I mean, uh, Willie, but in another time, is, is looking at some of the accounts of people as we get towards the end of the war and they know that there's a chance that, that partition is perhaps happening and, 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 and how actually they're really quite sad about it. Um, because, yes, South Asia is um, in many ways divided by, well, it's divided in a number of different ways and, 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 and religion or background or whatever is, is one of them. And um, they had the three different, um, three subunits, three squadrons per regiment. And they had for many years um, kept them as sort of homogenous in terms of predominantly religious uh, background, although the, the, there wasn't an issue. There was one issue um I think it must have been the six Lancers just looking there because they've got a, a Sikh squad and some of the, the um, no, I'm going to stop because I don't want to get that wrong. There was a slight um, refusal to soldier at one stage from one of the squadrons in one of the regiments, but I don't want to make the wrong accusation, so I'm not going to say it. But um, that, that's the sort of the, the makeup that they had. It, it's kind of irrelevant, um, but I just find it of interest that there is a, uh, a difference between them, and as you said, yeah, they 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 get to Italy through through different routes, and in many ways, they're they're they're, they're where they are in forty forty one and forty two is is as interesting um, as what they end up doing in Italy because um, again, I'm going to have to remind myself because I've, I can never remember. Um, Skinners are the first into action um, in Sudan. They go from Sudan quite early on to North Africa and then from North Africa into Italy. Central India horse, um, they start in North Africa. They then go to Sudan. So in the, the, those operations in early 41 um, against Keren and, 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 their, and, and Eritre, uh, Abyssinia and, and Sudan, um, they then go to Syria. They come back to North Africa. They go to Iraq and Tunisia before they go to Italy. And the six Lancers are also in, I think they're in Syria. They're certainly in Iraq before they go to Italy. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a roundabout route. So it's a bit of a roundabout route in terms of equipment and what they're doing. But, but it does mean by the time they get there that they're, they're, they're quite experienced. They've been away from home for a while. They've been soldiering for a while. They've picked up a certain amount of skills. Um, and so they are theor theoretically 
quite on top of their game by the time they get there. Um, good record in in, in uh, North Africa, uh, by all accounts. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 I haven't read much about the individual soldier, whether he be a, a Rajput or a Jat or a Dogra, and, and their view on uh, life. Um, did they see themselves as, as as fighting somebody else's war? Were they? Um, did they feel that they were the DDR judges in the same way that other uh, that British soldiers? I don't know that. Mm. Uh, I'm afraid. Um, I've concentrated more on the kit. But this is something you said is, is, is going to develop more because there seems to be a massive resurgence in India's interest in its World War Two and indeed First World War histories that perhaps wasn't there 20, 30 years ago. So. I like to think there are archives that have yet to be discovered of personal accounts and diaries and things that people who are focusing on whether it is um, cavalry units, reconnaissance units, or infantry units will start discovering these things. And we'll have, when, when people are rewriting even things like about the 14th Army in Burma in 10 years' time, I'm hoping there'll be more Indian information for and, volumes and of, course, of books in a few years to come. I, I hope so, and I think so. And you've got the double challenge that, that of course, well, treble challenge, but double challenge predominantly. Um, of these three regiments, six DCO Lancers are now in the Pakistan Army, whereas the other two are in the Indian Army. So you've got a, a, a you've got two lots of archives to, to to mine, and I'm pretty sure that the um, archives in Quetta in the the, the the staff college there. I mean, yes, I would love to to go and spend time looking at those. I, I think it'd be absolutely fascinating, but I don't think I'm going to be doing it anytime soon. Well, no, I mean, yeah, well, uh, no, exactly. Um, best, best move on from that. But um, <laughs> of the images you sent me, I, I love this one. I mean, it's very big, and I, the reason I love that one is that is a Morris C eight, a CS eight, I think. And I had a Morris C eight, which is the next model of that, um, which is about the most underpowered British truck of the early nineteen forties. Um, and I had the supposedly slightly more powerful one, so. Um, Using that for, at any kind of speed is, is just asking more of it than is possible. Um, so exp explain, and, and the Nazi flag. Um, so explain explain who that lot is. Um, not a clue. It's one of the regiments in, in, in North Africa. <laughs> um, and, and you're getting a lot of not a clue, don't know anything about this from me tonight, but, but we'll, get, we'll get some stuff that I do know about in a minute. But this is the, the, the preamble. Um, what they're doing cutting about in lorries I don't know. Was it as something? Was it a, a, a sort of LRDG type thing, or was that just a way of carrying? It? I'm I'm going to make a punt, and I'll explain why my I think my punt is sound when we get onto a, a slide in a bit. Is that this is uh, for carrying men around who then can jump off the lorry and go and do soldering stuff on their on their feet, uh, and that it's no more than than that because. Um, it's got no guns mounted on it, as far as I can tell. No, it's got a radio mast, doesn't it? It has, and so, so whether that's part of the yeah. command troop, I mean, but and he's it, got a headset on, isn't he? And yeah. he's on a he's on a mic. Um, yeah. So um, it's not, but it's not bristling with you know um, Lewis guns and fifty cals and so on, like you'd expect a um, one of the Chevrolets or the LRDG and so on. So I think, yeah, it, it, it's probably a squadron headquarters vehicle then, isn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't want to be going into combat in that far. The Chevrolets, by the time I'm kind of showing up my military vehicle, that they will go like shit through a goose. I mean, they are overpowered for what they will do. That That's exactly why the LRDG and others use those, because they are, you get a lot of... Um, a lot of speed for 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 and, and, and Chevrolet, pretty reliable engine. The Morrises are just awful. Just, I mean, I, I say I speak that with huge affection for Morrises, but they are. Just, I I I blew up two engines in my Morris C8. Uh, one in uh, one in not in the Netherlands and one in Normandy. So I did I did two. Okay, so I'm uh, quite the right places to be blowing them up, I guess. You know. Yeah. Well, um, I saw I was sidetracked being towed back from. Portsmouth are behind a Bedford QR, QL, QLR all the way up the A3, round the M25 and up the A12 at about 25 miles an hour. That was one of the most miserable experiences of my of my 52 years. But yeah, um, I'm sorry, folks, if I'm going back into um, into talking <laughs> about military vehicles, but it it does show. I would and the, the this this vehicle, by the way, folks, was out of date by 1939 for home service duty. I mean. I can only imagine it was out there and it was something they they found from somewhere else. I can't think this was shipped to anybody to use 
in this role. They, they, I think they must have acquired this second hand from a jumble sale. Like it's it's not front line. Okay. <laughs> Shall we go um, to Italy? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm not going for a tangent now. Well, no, so, yeah, let's get into the details of units and what they had. This is much and, more. And, and and this, I mean, my side, this this absolutely fascinates me. I mean, lots of it is hugely positive. I'll explain why. Um, although there are some negatives. The first thing is that what have we got on the right hand side? I've got what the three saber squadrons had, and each squadron had. Let's see the numbers there: 133 men. Um, so. Um, 400 men in, in the three squadrons, plus a headquarters squadron of 100, um, plus an RHQ of 35. So this is 535 men, which to me, from a mounted background, this is big. Um, I couldn't tell you what a current reconnaissance or a light cavalry or even an armor cavalry regiment has now, but but 500, I think if you went to any of the, the, the commanding officers of, of any of the cavalry regiments and said, would you like 535 women and men in your regiment right now? They go, yeah, please. So it's a lot of people. That means you can do stuff if you've got a lot of people. Yeah, you're going to get gaps and people get killed and injured and so on. Um, and, and there's going to be a challenge because, as you can see, lots of different kits. So so specialisms become a bit of a problem. But with 535 people, you can do stuff. So that game deny to see if exploit stuff, I've mentioned earlier, those tasks, you've got some, some, some resource, some... You're not allowed to say manpower. Well, it was manpower back then. Um, you've got some manpower to back it up. It, it, it's not just a a, a, a a false front. It's got some oomph behind it. And that's the first thing. Second thing is, and I'll go through each of these in a, in a, in a bit more, but with, with all these different capabilities, again, you can do lots of different things. The downside is with lots and lots of different bits of kit and therefore capabilities is that you're a bit penny-packeted. I accept mm. that, even though you've got lots of people. I mean, you can mass them, and they can all jump out of the vehicles, and you've got a battalion's worth of, of men. But um, there is a danger that that only one of those organisations, those troops, can do task X, and only one of the other ones can, pardon me, do task Y. And so straight away, you, you can't overlap, and so it becomes a bit of a challenge. And shall we, shall we have a look at the, the, the vehicles? So comms troop, top left, has got a Humber. Right. And there's a couple of shots I've, I've borrowed from the Imperial War Museum. Um, I don't know where I got the top left one from. And if so, somebody feels uh, I have done wrong of them by not putting a, a credit on, I apologise. Um, I, 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 I am not an armoured car expert in any way, shape or form. And I found this quite interesting when um, going through and, and putting this together. Is that, um, well, and, and again, the one I did before Christmas is, is how little I knew about armoured cars when... The cavalry in um, Northwest Europe, we had quite a lot of calm armor car regiments who did some great stuff. I mean, blue coat springs to mind straight away, but there are lots of other examples. That's just perhaps the one I know the best with the House of Cavalry. And you know, you get that the 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 I was say the ninth or the twelfth, or was it both of them? Lancers doing great stuff again on on armor cars. So it's slightly surprising how little I knew about um these 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 things um but small light we're well, not this one five tons i guess something like that um it's got about what is it 100 horsepower something like that paul you know more about this um, i don't know what is horsepower but it, it, it it's it's fairly weak the humber's pretty good yeah of, okay. it's, it, it'll move it'll it'll do 50 yeah which no, no. which which frankly is probably enough on roads because the roads of 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 Italy and North Africa. What, what state would they have been in? So, so I can't really see there being much need to do much more than um, than that. Um, as part of the problem is, you know, that's a, that's a little bit of a pop gun. Um, this is this is command troop, comms troop, which which means as much. Um, you know, liaison as well as command and radios, but you can mount a couple of radios in there. It's perhaps a slightly odd choice in that it is a, um, it's got a gun turret. Mm. Why not go back to that lorry we've just looked at in the desert and, and use that as a as a comms troop? Um, but this is what they've got. And um, well, can we just go, to remind ourselves? Uh, David O'Keefe mentioned it a few minutes ago. The diversity of the units in Italy, in terms of nationality and in terms of how we use them. So. The Indi there, there is a, is it two Indian division in, infantry divisions in Italy or one? Sorry, three, three Indian three. divisions. Yeah, um, and 
uh, was it four four British weather? It's, but so, what what do we think is expected of the um the the reconnaissance or cavalry regiments? I'll refer to your um, language in Italy. Do we know anything about what was expected of them before they land? No, I, I don't know that. But but um, I mean, I'm Except pretty sure having flexibility for a variety of tasks. Given given um, going back to your slide, they can do it. They with five hundred men, um, and mortars and communications and different types of vehicle. They can. They, they have a, a lot of different things they can do and they can change their role very quickly. Yes. I mean, I, I, I rather cheesily started my talk, which I did for the Tendry uh, Military Literature Festival. I referred to them as the, the Indian Swiss Army Knife. And, and actually last year yeah. there was an article in one of the Indian papers saying that the, the Indian Army had actually um, started buying a Swiss Army Knife, which was in the colour of the Indian Army's camouflage on it, which was a, a, a slightly cheesy way. They are Swiss Army Knife, but I mean, I don't think they're, Jack of all trades, master of none, because I think they are masters within their own little bit of what they're doing. Um, they have clearly developed, they didn't have all of these vehicles with them the whole way through um, East Africa and North Africa. Um, some of these have come online later, as we saw the, the, the lorries and so on we had before. Um, but they are a divisional asset. They do bounce around a little bit. I think Central India Horse go off and, 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 and swap to a different division for a bit. Uh, but it is at that out front scouting, but they're not equipped for that toe to toe fight. No. And, and, and you know, I, I'm, I, and there's a, the, about the only thing that's able to do that toe to toe fight with, with, with the enemy is either uh, is a, an infantry tank, a, a Churchill um, in this case. And so uh, they're not equipped for that. But they are able to do other stuff. So what was the next one that comes out? I can't remember. Oh, yeah. The, the um, next one up will be this is where it gets a bit interesting. And I'm very willing to take some, some help on this. The, the second organization I had on the left-hand side of my chart was a thing called support troop or, or fire support troop and Skinner's horse have this AEC armor car um, which again is quite interesting um, I, I know little about it as well um, but um, what is interesting is the range of turrets that are available for this one yeah. um, and you probably know where I'm heading with that um do I no no you've lost me now okay I'm trying to find I'm trying to find a, a, another picture but um the AC um shown here with um um I can't which gun that is um is that a six pounder um they also had a version with um the um oh, oh what's the name of the bloody tank um <sighs> Have we lost Gareth for a second there? I don't want Jinx again tonight, folks. You still there, Gareth? Oh, this is fun. Yeah, I think it's a six-pounder. We seem to have temporarily lost Gareth for a second. Hopefully he'll come back. Um, yep. Oh, come back, Gareth. Um, while, we're, while I'm waiting for Gareth to come back, um, this is a fascinating subject about reconnaissance regiments. And Italy, I would argue, has perhaps the greatest variety of terrain and con battlefield conditions over a short space of time in that you've got beaches and mountains and rivers and urban and then semi-urban and villages and then nothing and then rocks and then forests and then mud and then rivers. And I would imagine that uh, a, a reconnaissance arm, a reconnaissance element that like this with 500 men is a tool you can wield and change its use pretty damn quickly back and forth. Uh, and that's kind of the, the point we're talking about tonight is this ability for the Indian uh, regiments to, to do different things with these vehicles. And um, yeah, I hope Gareth comes back in a minute. We were talking in advance about the fact that this format that we have on World War II TV, we don't necessarily have to have a point to these shows in the sense we don't have to have a beginning middle and end and have a like a phd where you draw a conclusion saying support and, and here's my present here's my definitive conclusion to this we can just toss an idea toss a subject around for a while and and just talk about how something is interesting without necessarily knowing everything about it we're, we're looking at this subject we're finding it fascinating and we're realizing there's a lot more we can know on it and know about it and i just hope Gareth comes back in and joins me, so I'm not struggling, struggling on my own again. But yeah, 
And for those who are saying, yes, I was when I when my Morris C8 did break down uh, in Normandy. That was my second engine I blew up. I was towed all the way back by a Bedford 1944 QLR. And, um, and when I blew it up in the Netherlands, that was in Bussum, a military vehicle. But I, and I drove it back. Uh, it was, it was, I blew a ring and it was popping smoke. I managed to get on the ferry and I, dro- I managed to drive it back home at that time, even though I'd blown up an engine that it was smoke pouring out of it. And I got back and, and made it back in one piece, just about. But, um, yeah, I hope Gareth will be with us again very shortly. That will be good, nice. Um, so I'd have to keep on rabbiting on my own, but, um, yes, David O'Keefe, I am very well, thank you at the moment. Um, and, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping gareth comes back i'm just checking on the face i haven't heard anything from it uh nothing yet i'm hoping he'll come back in so yeah um and by the way as as we talked about if anyone knows anything about indian armored units and reconnaissance regiments please share information with us it's an interesting subject and um we're going to talk about some other bits in a minute when gareth comes back and um yeah come on gareth I'm, i'm i'm running out of things to say now How's the weather where you are um, watching? Yeah. Uh, come on, Gareth. Um, yeah. I should, I should start talking about something else, shouldn't I? Let me talk about what I know about armoured cars. So um, uh, the British, as with our vehicles, generally it's the, the problem is standardisation. Um, we're using guys, Humbers, AECs, Daimlers, a whole variety of stuff. Looks like Gareth is back now. Hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm on my phone. I don't know what's happened to my desktop. So. Oh, I'm you've broken it. There we go. If I put that there and sit back a bit, hopefully you're not looking at my nostril. Um, you're upside down. Da- there we go. Go to reversionary techniques, and I'll hold it there, and I'll put it up. And I've no idea what's happened to my um, desktop whatsoever. Um, but never mind. We can soldier on. Where did we get to? Good. I, well, I was just filling in without you. I was just talking generally about... Um, uh the british armored cars too many too many different types too many different manufacturers we're converting previous pre-war trucks and um and the humber armored car evolves out of the humber it, it's a truck that then becomes a staff car and then becomes an armored car they yeah. they all they all come out of the same origin the same with the the, the, the guy ant became the guy i the aec um we're, we're making do with what we have and then just developing from it the, the americans had more of an ability I know the white and international kind of come out of tractors and things like that, but they have a bit more of a design around an armored vehicle first. We sort of adapt what we already have, but that was where I was got to. But we're back. We're, we're, we've got you back now, so we can talk and, about. And that is a problem that's continued, you know, into the the the. the... 20th 21st century well the humvee when they try to make it up armored it suffered from exactly the same problems that 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 these armored cars were suffering from when by putting armor on a car um originally making it heavier without necessarily changing the rest of the stuff which is a bad thing clearly um yeah we'd looked at sorry yeah i was going to move on central engine horse i was happy that they had the the, the sorry skinners have the aec the next one up is the the central engine horse um india horse the next one and I have read, I've had a couple of references, um, that they had the, the close support staghound armoured car, but I'm not 100% sure about this. This this I would love to hear uh, a bit more about. Um, why would they have got the staghound rather than the AEC? Well, a numbers game. Um, where else was the staghound used? I mean, it's got a smart looking machine. It looks the part in a way that perhaps... Uh, a little more than the hum, uh, no, a little more than the AEC. Um, again, I know nothing about its. Well, it was it was used on till the 1960s, if not the 70s. It was sold extensively around the world. I mean, the French, I know, used them. I think Brazil used them. Whereas the Humber and the AEC, I think their service. Well, the Humber, I know, was used a bit out in Cyprus and uh, Palestine, but not for very long. But the Staghound had at least 20 years beyond the war. And someone may be able to correct me. It may have even gone into the, 70s, the 80s. I don't know. But the Staghound was was probably the, the pick of the bunch in terms of the armoured cars that we produced. And and what I'm looking at that with my sort of modern FV head on, it almost looks like it's got that 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 what is now traditional V-shaped hull, which is to to, yeah. to the mind blast. But that may purely be coincidence um, and nothing to do with it whatsoever. So no, that was a South the South Africans, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, were the first to identify the V-shape for armoured cars yeah. in the North Africa. They had the 
I forget what the South African art was. It the Mar Marmon Har Harrington. Yes, the Mar yeah the Marmon Har Harrington Harrington yeah Marmon Harrington. And that was that was V shaped. They worked out that that was um, that was effective there. Um, and and again, I think I think the Indian Army, I think in North Africa, developed some of these techniques. So, which all got, as you say, all got you recycled decades later in other in other directions. But but, but some yeah, having forgotten it in the first place, which is not necessarily a good thing. So yeah, staying home, not convinced about. It. But the next one that the support troop had is the one that I find truly amazing is that the six Lancers, the Duke of Connaught's own, had these things. Um, M3 half-track, known as the gun motor carriage. And um, those are 75 millimetres. That can be used direct fire or, as shown there, as, as artillery pieces. Now, they've only got, um, I can't remember, oh, six of these. But, you know, that, that that's a little bit of firepower. Uh, available to the regiment to go and support an operation. And you know, would you... Would you Yes, you prefer to have an artillery regiment, uh, especially if it's got um, something like a 105. But I'm going to offer you six of these to help support the operation. We like them. Well, I think the answer is yes, please. Um, there is only the one troop. You could split it down a bit, working in pairs. But again, that lessens the effectiveness. Um, but but I think quite a quite quite a lot of capability there, and I rather like the idea of these. Um, I, I think you can do quite a bit with it. Other British regiments had them. The, King's Dragoon Guards, um, they certainly had them um, in, 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 in the same theatre. Um, this is going very much away from recce. I mean, I know you, you prefer the term cavalry, but this is, this is again, suggesting that the label of cavalry stroke reconnaissance is, is a loose label, and the, the, they, are, they are seeing these as doing more of a, more of a greater variety of things than just because you don't do reconnaissance in that, do you? No, but you provide the support, the fire support, the on call fire support to allow your armoured cars or your your, 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 your your men and women on, on their belt buckles schnurgling forward to do whatever they need to do to find the enemy. And these guys are there, these guys and girls are there ready to be called upon. Um, should it all go Pete Tong? So yeah. um yes, this is this is still this is headquarters squadron, but this is this is not one of the reconnaissance no. No. So this is this is a support element. Um, and so I don't, I, I think it's, it, 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 it's entirely valid, but, um, and the next one we've got, oh, I haven't got a picture, I had it on the main picture, it, but there's also, no, sorry, if we stick with just fire support for a minute, there's a mortar troop, um, mounted in, um, um, carriers, universal carriers. They've got a 75 millimeter mortar. So between the, the six tubes, six mortars and, 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 and these guys, you've actually got quite a lot of fire support. Um, 12 barrels, 12 tubes, 12 pieces that, yeah, 75 millimeter, whether it be a gun or a mortar, not a huge amount of HE, but, but 12 of those landing on your head every 10 seconds will have an impact. And so, um, so the, so the recce regiment has, comms troop, forget them, but, but between the support troop and the, the mortar troop, it has its fire support that can be used um, should the 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 the, the recce squadrons get into trouble, um, but it's the recce squadrons which were where we were moving on to then. Yeah. Um, and again, this is where I'm going to absolutely bow to your superior knowledge because the uh, the, the Otter armored car uh, shown on the right apparently is um, has been developed from the the Chevrolet truck. That's a standard pattern. Oh, what's the terminology? I learned this and I've now forgotten it completely. Um, C CMP Canadian Military yeah. Pattern. Uh, that's the lad. Yeah, yeah, there we go. I've even scribbled it down here. Um, I, I think that's amazing that it's come from that. So, and that, and that was just one of the, the shots I found of a, 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 a Chevrolet. Um, most interestingly, most of the shots I found online are of Ford CMPs, not of Chevrolet. But apparently the Otter came from the, the, the Chevrolet version. Um, yeah, because the Chevrolet was better powered. Yeah, I, I had a mate uh, who had one of the, the an Otter. He had it painted in desert camo years and years and years ago, and it was about the most reliable military vehicle I knew. It was it, it would go it went like stink. It would Brilliant. sit on the on the on the motorways in England and roll down there at sixty, uh, almost um, brilliantly reliable vehicle, but uh, almost nothing in the way of armament, but was very reliable and very fast. Well, if you look at the size of the armored car there. You know, it, 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 looking at it, you can see that it is based on something that's had a, 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 an armoured body put to it. 
Um, so it's protected, but I would argue it's it's probably not a very good um, armoured car for, for, for reconnaissance just because of the size. And if we look at the next slide, um, the other squadrons, sorry, the other regiments had, it's the one at the front I want to focus on, it, it, that, that is hopefully a dingo. Yeah. Um, and um, I wonder if anybody sharp-eyed to come up on the comments that there's a picture of a dingo um, on the um, on that organization slide I gave, but it's not actually a Daimler Dingo, it's the Ford version on that first slide. But that, that's a Daimler there, and I think Lynx is that a behind. Lynx? The Ford uh, one, I think the Lynx Ford one is a Lynx, or is that the Australian one? Um, Ford, Ford Lynx is it, yes. Um, yeah, I think that so Dingo armored car, look at it, tiny little scout car, um, which develops into the ferret, which is used up until oh god, there, there, there are people who went to war in ferrets 30 years ago in the Gulf. Um, so not that long ago. Um, it, it, it's what you'd expect a sort of little scout car perhaps to be um, in the way that the Otter isn't. So they're going to be operating differently. And so that, I think, gives you a slight problem. But that a recce regiment, they haven't got the same equipment. They're not going to be used in the same way. And so while there might have been a baseline doctrine or even a baseline concept of operations for these uh, organisations, they're going to be different. Now, clearly, they're going to be different based on the task and the, and the, the, the terrain um, and, and the enemy. But just by having an otter versus a dingo, you're going to operate differently. I mean, the dingo is quite quiet. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, you know that it purrs, doesn't it? It's, it's um, a weird fluid cancelled transmission or something, isn't it? it it's it's it, everything is is oil, in oil beds. It's I, I, I had a mate had a dingo. It's uh, very very quiet. Yeah, but it is quite quiet. It can it can get pretty close to you without without you hearing it. Um, and maybe the otter can do the same. Maybe I'm being very unfair on the otter, but I'm just guessing because it's based on that um, Chevrolet Canadian military pattern truck that it's 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 going to be less of a, a schnurgel machine than than a dingo might be. Um, but that's what they're used for. They've got um, quite a lot of them in the troop. Um, uh, it gives them quite a capability. Next one on, which I don't think we've got a slide of, was was the carrier troop. No, we we'll go back one, please. Thanks. Um, so um, there are two carrier troops. They are using universal carriers. Um, there's then also a jeep troop. I think it's only the Central India Horse who have the jeep troop. So again, they've got an extra set of manpower, um, 12 men, four jeeps, three men. Um, that the other regiments don't have. So that gives them some extra flexibility. And you know, if you've got four extra Jeeps around, that's no bad thing, is it? You can you can do stuff with a Jeep, even if it's just yeah. popping back to headquarters to find out what the heck's going on or vice versa. And the, the final vehicle is, um, the final organisation within the squadron is the rifle troop, uh, rifle platoon. And these have got a mixture of kits. Some of them have got M3 half tracks. Some of them have got that, oh, what's that? It's the car that looks like a half track, but it's four wheels. Um, a white, a white scout car. That's the that's the one. Yeah, I had one of them as well. Yeah, that that they now, now that they are a lovely vehicle. I mean, to me, that that the the, the, the white scout car is famous for that um, photograph of GOC Eleventh Armored Division in, in Normandy. Um, Pitt Roberts standing in, in, yeah, in his yeah, command, yeah, yeah. but. Um, they don't really need anything particularly special because they're, they're going to operate on foot. So they, they've got a, um, it's a vehicle for getting them from A to B. Some of them actually use lorries. Excuse me, moving this around. My arm's getting a uh, some, some of them using lorries. And so um, it, it, it's for getting about. Yeah, the next slide was um, the map. Now, hopefully I'm back on on my machine. So I wonder whether can we can, can I be on on two places? Uh, you, have to call, you have to go out and come in again, um, I think. Well, let's just see what, what my desktop's doing. Or oh, let, let it carry on. I, um, problem is I can't see the, the map, so I've forgotten where it's where. This is, this is a, 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 about the... I rather like this map. This is a map that comes from... There are two books that, that talk about the Indian infantry in um, Italy. The Tigers... Um, the Tiger Triumphs this is from and there's a predecessor and i thought this map was very good because those those boxes i don't know how well others can see them on their screen but those boxes show which division was where and where they were operating um yeah and some of these divisions actually operating quite a lot of places in in, in italy and I, I i scribbled down a list because again i always 
you know, my memory is rubbish and I, I forget stuff. Um, and of course, I can't find the list because having gone offline, I've started throwing myself. Yes, so um, Central India Horse, who are with 4th Indian Division, um, predominantly Gothic line is where they spend most of their time uh, in action. Um, six Lancers, oh, sorry, ten, and Skinner's Horse, who are 10th, they do most of their spare actions up in the north and the Senio area. Uh, in fact, they've got Senio Floodbank as one of their battle honours, which I, I think is an interesting name for a battle honour. Um, six Lancers are probably, DCOs are probably the busiest. They end up, they're up on the um, the Sangro, the Moro, they're at Casino t- the second or third. Um, they're in the Liri Valley, they're up on the Senio, and they're at the Santono Crossing. So they're, they're, they're the ones who are perhaps mixing it up the most. That's not to suggest that, that the other regiments uh, aren't. Um, but um, and they all have some wonderful um, stories to tell. Um, the sixth end up doing um, quite early on doing a, 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 a in, in I think they arrive in, in in November '43. Quite early on, they end up doing a dismounted wrecking, and they're up in an Indian village, Indian Italian village, and um, they manage to see some German positions, evade them, gone around the side, and they evade some um, German cavalry on horseback. And they eventually go into a village where they um, are sort of snuggling through the village of Rossello. Um, and they walk down the main street. They look into a window. They see a load of Germans having a, a cup of tea and a, and a bit of cake. Um, and they're thinking, hmm, what do we do now? Um, and as they're working out what to do, a couple of Germans have obviously heard the front door. Um, so they shot one in the stomach straight away. The other one surrendered and they took him back. They threw a... Um, grenade into the tea party and ran away with their, their prisoner. And there are lots of little tales like this in these days. They're, they're out and about doing stuff, scouting, finding out what's going on, causing a mischief. Um, they're not partisans, although later in the war they do link, link that's horse actually link up with some uh, partisans for some of their action. Um, Central India horse, nice little action um, in um, mid-44 July. Um, in the book, they describe it as as a, a, a United Nations force because there's there's um, I think there's some some New Zealanders and some Canadians and some Italian labourers involved. There's a, a road being built, and and one of the OCs of one of the squadrons, Major Patterson and a sapper, they end up manhandling their jeep. And that's one of the joys, I guess, of of one of those old jeeps. They're, 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 there's not much to them, um, and that if you can't go through something you can sort of get out and push it and drag it and not quite pick it up and take it around uh, and um they were approaching a village in one direction and were keen to get there um, ahead of the new zealanders who were coming the other way and, and and off they went and just again those sort of i mean i'm sure infantrymen would have done something similar but but a, a little bit of me says it's that that there's a cavalry officer. He was a, a you know major. He'd been a cavalryman for quite some time. And it's a come on, we're, we're going through. Um, some of the tasks, the deception tasks. I mentioned gain, deny, deceive, exploit. Decep- deception. Deception can be a um, you know go and do something over there so that the, the Germans think think that's where we're coming from. Which means go and draw some fire over there. Go and get shot at over there. And um, Italy, as you know, lots of bridging operations, and and, and, and some of them are fantastic. Just, just, just some of the, the the spans they put in, building a bailey bridge is, as you know, very noisy, and um, it's it's fairly obvious what's going on. What else would be making that much noise of that type? Metal clanging together, uh, and up in the Liri Valley, six lancers again. They were tasked to go and um, uh, create a, 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 some noise using bits of angle iron um, rail. Or, uh, some some railway line tracks so on and bang them together. They put up some dummy positions um, that they built, and that was enough to, to to convince the Germans that the bridge was being built somewhere else. Clearly, it 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 uh, attracted quite a lot of fire, um, and and not a particularly pleasant task. But you know that's what happens when you're sent out to do um, deception tasks. So so all three regiments have their. I was going to call it fun. That that some people might find that a, an odd thing for me to say. I, I, I'm not suggesting it was fun. Going we know what you mean. not fun at all. But but yeah, it, it, it's perhaps a, a poor choice of phrase, and I apologise for that. But you know, they were getting into these little scraps, these little fights, and and you end up with some of those troops going off and doing a bit 
with a, an, an infantry battalion, some attached to working with one of the armoured regiments that's there uh, and scouting around and then calling in the tanks to, to, for the, the, you know, the heavy, um, I'm going to call it heavy firepower. It's not the firepower, it's the armour, it's going toe-to-toe -to -toe that you want um, from the tanks. So, I mean, all three, actually, all three regiments um, fight well. Don't all regiments? I think they do. I'm certainly not trying to suggest that any others don't fight well. Uh, and have an interesting time. Um, but I said, I think it was the, the but I said six that end up with the sort of the the, the, the lion's share of the actions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and and you know, you, we, we said before we went live, you have kind of got a conclusion uh, about their use in Italy, which we can come to as well. I mean, you've you've kind of you've you've come you've you've, you've had a thought about this process. Journey. I love, by the way, you talked about the deception because I remember talking to, I think it was four or three recce guys from Normandy, who had a particular thing they did with their Humber heavies, which was to draw fire of the Germans while something sneaky was happening elsewhere. And in their case, they would go up, and they would turn the vehicles round, ready to get back, but have the, the barrels, the turrets pointing forward. So it looks like from a distance, they're about to go off into the German lines. Then they would make lots yeah. of noise. The Germans would open up on them and they just hair off back you know, down the road. They'd already prepared to go around. That was a kind of tried and tested trick. And they could, they could come under fire, but have, have left that area within about five seconds. That was their trick. And and, and and by the time the Germans have realized the target they're shooting at have gone away, whatever the sneaky thing that was happening elsewhere yeah. has already started or commenced or finished or whatever. And that was a tried and tested within four or three reckon. Now, again, I have no idea whether this was something that was transferred from, from four or three recce to, I don't know, 51 recce or 49 recce. This is where we get into this difficulty of there not being much written down about recce stroke cavalry yeah doctrine if you like yeah i mean there will be i mean i'm, I'm looking over at uh, military training publications book i've got down there there's probably some interesting stuff in there which i need to um do more work on and, and read but um i have no idea what the base doctrine was and then how they modified it you know for example the, the record arnhem where where did they just say hey Come on, we've got some jeeps with some guns on. Let's go for it. And again, they yes, they were infantrymen, but they were of that gung ho, which is a positive comment um, attitude. Got to get to the bridge. Let's go for it. Um, was that a doctrinal um, role? From recollection, that, that was Goff. One Freddie Fred Goff, Goff, Major uh, Goff, wanting a bigger role. From my recollection, I've got I've got the book, a couple of books on first airborne reconnaissance. Good. From my recollection, that was Goff wanting a, a bigger role, a more central role for his squadron, and him accepting anything that was offered because he wanted part of the battle. I'm not saying that in any critical way. I'm just saying that's that's yeah. that how I remember how they ended up being deployed in that particular role at Arnhem. But I may, again, I may be wrong on that. I may yeah. be misremembering that. But, but a lot of it, I think, is, is, is what, we, what is called mission command now. You give some people some kit. They know what the overall command is trying to achieve. And they work out the best way to help their boss and their boss's boss achieve him. And as they're driving down the road um, carefully and they see that uh, the enemy have got a bridge ahead of them, but they're still rigging the charges for demolition, um, you go for it. And you make yeah. that decision there on the ground that or you say actually let them do it. And so so I think recce regiments, whether they come from the infantry anti-tank um, companies or, or cavalry by the end, are, are all working in a similar mindset. Uh, I'm not suggesting differently. And they are on that exploitation mindset. Um, winning. It's all about winning. So, yeah, I, I, I would like to, to study more the, the doctrine because I think there are some parallel. I think the British Army might find some of it interesting. Um, I think there are some parallels. Ah, yes. Um, we're now. Um, this is a lovely little village in Italy whose name escapes me. And this photograph here was actually taken by Tom Holland, as in James Holland's brother. Um, yep. I couldn't get a, a, a decent photo. I just happened to see that. Tom had mentioned it on, on Twitter some years ago and said, oh, you've got a photo, and he, he sent me this one. This is a memorial to two men, um, to Ditto Ram, 
who was a seller in the um, and um, in the Central India Horse, and to Lieutenant Sinjin Young. Sinjin was was actually a tank regiment officer uh, attached to them, and they were, as happens, um, found themselves in a minefield, German minefield, and and Ditto Ram had a had a leg blown off, um, which for for quite a lot of us would be a a, a showstopper, um, but he. Ram didn't stop there and then. He went and gave first aid to another uh, patrol member, um, sorted out this other person who was injured before Ram then passed out and, and, and sadly died soon after. Um, Young was also um, injured in the leg, it, not blown off, but, but badly injured. He didn't stop either. Um, he managed to, to get a message sent back. Um, he helped look after the patrol. He that was like the mind He told them to stay put, and, and he sort of comforted them, um, gave them support whilst they were out there. Um, five hours later, they are rescued from the minefield. Um, as I say, sadly, Ditto Ram is is, is dead by this stage. Um, Sinjin Young isn't. Um, they recover him, but sadly, he died on the the way to hospital. And the village is actually called Mon Montechi. They are. Uh, it's come to me because I've got it written down in front of me. And they both get the George Cross, which is quite interesting um, that they get a George Cross rather than a military cross or a, a military medal or an Indian Distinguished Service Medal for, for Ram versus a, an MC. Um, and, and I rather like the fact in this case, they both got the same award um, for doing essentially the same thing. Um, should they have both got the VC? I don't get into those sort of discussions. Really, I think they're 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 not helpful. Um, could they have got the VC because it wasn't against enemy action because they weren't being shot at? It was just an enemy minefield. Um, I don't know. But um, these are the the two. There's a lot. You know, there's a few MCs handed out uh, across the board. There's a there, there are Indian Distinguished Service Medals uh, handed out, and there are. Um, um, MMs, but these are the two highest awards that are, that are given. No VCs go to um, the three regiments. And is there anything um, written in any of the memoirs of some of the senior commanders in Italy or uh, about the use of reconnaissance forces generally? Is there any? I, I'm guessing no, not really. Um, so, so we don't really necessarily no, know I mean, what, how they were considered. No, the divisional accounts, they, they mention a few actions that they sent X regiment up that hill to li to link up with my organization, or as I say, partisans is one of them, perhaps some 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 tank regiments, North Irish horse, um, certainly get a mention in one of the divisional histories of that linking up with one of the cavalry regiments. Um, but they don't get much of a mention. Um, they don't get much of a mention in a number of books. Oh, there's a there, there's a oh this is yes, this is sort of after the war. We 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 moved on. Um because um, Central India Horse um, don't last. Um, they go off to Greece in... Um, is that Central India Horse? I can't remember. Yes, it is. Uh, they go off to Greece in, in late 44, because we, we remember we send is it 40, 46 and 50 RTR, plus some 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 dismounts, um, plus Central India Horse and, and one or two others go off to, to, to Greece to try and um, stop the communists ruining it all. Um, is my short and subtle take on what they go off there for. Um, and this, this is an interesting photo. The, the reason I put this up is, is that the, the, the man who took, has this photograph in his collection is a retired um, Major General, um, Syed Ali uh, Hamid Ali. Oh, I can never remember his name. Um, Syed Ali Hamid, who is a, 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 a Major General in the, the Pakistan Army. Um, his father... Um, was also a major general, set up the ISI, the inter-services people, the, the, sort of, um, the intelligence organization in, in um, Pakistan. Um, Pakistan has the sixth Lancers as one of its regiments. Um, general Hamid didn't command them. He commanded one of the others. Um, he's also related, I hadn't realized for the weekend, chatting to him, to um, um, Salman Rushdie um, and to, um, from Radio B Radio Four for, to Michal Hussein, um, hmm. so quite an interesting family. It has nothing to do with armor cars, Indian cavalry regiments in 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 Italy whatsoever. Um, it's a completely random uh, rabbit hole. But um, I just thought I bung his photograph in there 
uh, to give him a mention. Um, he writes a weekly article about the, 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 the both Indian Armoured Corps prior to 48 and the Pakistan Army Corps post 48 in, in a weekly paper in Pakistan. Um, and, and he's written a couple of books about um, Pakistan Armoured Corps at, at the forward edge of battle. Um, so post partition um, and development of the modern Pakistan Armour Corps, including those, those various wars they've had with, with, with India, which are in themselves absolutely fascinating, yeah. but that's not World War II, so I'll shut up on that. So it, when we get to consider Indian cavalry stroke wrecking regiments in India and indeed British similar units, and we said earlier that you know, the, the Reconnaissance Corps is swallowed up by RAC and, and ceases to exist, is it possible your re your your thinking behind the fact they don't exist is because the army didn't know really what to do with them how to classify them quantify them categorize them and it was they 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 could do too many things is that maybe they just don't fit in well they they, they fit in but aren't needed to be separate and i think they 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 fit in because they're cavalry and and reconnaissance is the primary role and, and, and that role exists in the Royal Army Corps. By, by oh, 1939, there are essentially three, three and a half different organisations in, the, in the, the new form Royal Army Corps. There are tank regiments, which happen to all come from the RTR, equipped with Matildas. There are um, armoured regiments equipped with cruisers. Some are lighter, some are a bit heavier, which are a mixture of cavalry and RTR, and there are armoured car regiments, which are all exclusively um, cavalry. The, the, the half is the light tank, which yeah. which have existed, but now get absorbed into the other organisations. So you've got three distinct roles. Um, and come, and I agree, the armoured Corps to this day has a sort of, has three distinct roles. It, it, it's taken a, a bit of a circuitous route to get there. So, so reconnaissance, Corps going to the armor corps in many ways makes a lot of sense because it's a it's a core role and has been for you know reconnaissance 1914 you know the the cavalry regiments that go to France with the BEF in 1914 there's two corps um, Smith Dorian's corps and um, Haig's corps um, probably the the best most reformed okay from a low starting point most reformed bits of the British 1914. And they are doing the same. They're scouting. They're 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 they're, they're gain, deny, deceive, exploit. That that's that's what they're doing. So there is a tradition. This is a cavalry role. We mechanize. We 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 split out infantry tanks, cruiser tanks, armor cars a bit. We then come back together post war uh, and to where we are now. And so I think it wasn't a case of there wasn't a role. It was the logical place for them to be. And if you look at a, a, a what was a reconnaissance regiment of the 80s and 90s and to some extent the thousands they had um uh, a mixture of troops some they had scorpions and and, and originally scorpions and then scimitars but they also had the spartan the spartan would have uh, a support troop an assault troop um, they didn't have mortars they had some guided weapons which are that sort of support troop so so there is a there is a bit of a read across um from this organization here across to what a, a reconnaissance regiment of the well until until relatively recently I don't, in fact theoretically still exists um um is, is is like so i think it might be serendipitous the way they get there but i think it is it, it is a logical conclusion hmm no it's it's it, it's i think it, it it's this is one of those subjects that's in many ways raising more questions than it is answering them but in a good way i mean that in a good way you know it's um it's it's just another aspect of warfare that we realize is understudied underappreciated and underwritten about and you know the fact that there's so many vehicles and so many people out there and there's not much information is just interesting in and of itself um and all part of the evolution and of yeah of, of how to do things yeah, Ricky calls a wartime invention. Um, you've got your standing cavalry regiments with all the names and numbers. Um, if you're having to contract, you, you're not going to go hold on to fourth Ricky regiment, but get rid of the the ninth lancers. I mean, that would just be crazy. Um, but you can keep the ninth lancers. 
but give them the recce role. So uh, mm. yeah, I, it makes it makes total sense in my mind. We have a we'll, we'll round things off, Fraser. We have a question from the great you mean about how men were killed and wounded and yeah. what the main causes were. I would imagine it's a bit of everything. Very, and yeah. the, the, the the fatality figures are are. are I was about to say ridiculously low. Gosh, whenever you talk about one fatality is is, is not low, um, but I mean we're we're, we're talking small numbers. I um, mean overall between the three regiments, I think it's something like hundred are killed, which clearly for two hundred families is, is is awful. But in the greater scheme of things, um, when you consider some of those hard yards fighting that was going on in Italy, <laughs> you know we we plan to get to to, to, to the um um road by goodness knows when but it took us until 45 to get up there really um yeah. it was it was proper hard yard so that that as few as 150 to 200 fatalities is 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 surprisingly low um i think that the, the the six lancers have the highest number i think it's something like sort of 80 90 gusting 100 men killed uh, regiments there uh, numbers are lower, which reflects their their, their relatively um, lower amounts of action um, compared. Mm. So, so yeah, fairly light, um, and 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 that actually is representative of the role they're trying to do. Again, talked about some of the four three recce officers I spoke to. Um, a, a, a good month was never having fired their guns. I mean, that means you've not you've done your job, uh, but you've not had to run for it and and try and take on as you say toe to toe you know it's all about um recce um and and relaying information uh, or to others to exploit the info the information you have found out if you're going if you're going toe to toe essentially you fail yeah you, you're avoiding the fight if you're a cavalry regiment you're finding it you're finding out where the enemy is so somebody else for you um ultimately yeah. yeah, Colin Taylor's brought up the whole subject of um, of class again because I know Colin, that's what Colin, Colin, one of Colin's things. And you're completely right. Um, there is that element. We had the conversation before going online, Colin and others, about why some regiments got war raised and some ha were split. And there's lots of things. There's so many things that you could go and study that 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 haven't been studied yet. Like Twenty Fourth Lancers were a war raised unit. Why didn't we make another battalion of an existing unit? And you know, where the conclusion is, there must be a reason, but we neither of us know what that reason is. Um, and it, maybe it's maybe there's a reason reason somewhere written in the War Office. But um, anyway, in terms of what we're doing tonight, given that you're holding your phone and the the, the, the it's, it's audio is cutting in and out a bit, we've had. We've, I think we should kind of quit while we're ahead, Gareth. Um, but in terms of if anyone's oh, watching this who's got more information about this or with, or how can point us in a direction to go and, and and look at some look at this subject more widely or or we could start a Facebook group about people who are interested in reconnaissance uh, in in Italy generally or or Indian regiments we're we're open to we're open to suggestions. Um, wouldn't it be lovely if there's some Indian historian watching this who's going, why didn't they contact me? I've got it all. Well, that'd be great. That would be great if there is such a person out there who's done some work, done the, heart, the heavy lifting. Yeah. This to being purely teeing up some some proper experts and, 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 and just sort of, you know, I'm new to this. I mean, I think it's fascinating. I think the Italian campaign is fascinating. You've got some great talks coming up. Um, but this, from a capability perspective, is 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 the the, the Indian cavalry regiments are really interesting, um, as are the as are the, the recce regiments in Northwest Europe. But but you were doing a week on Northwest Europe, you're doing Italy, and it therefore gave me the opportunity. And, and and I think it is important to talk about those other nations that fought along by the British, and 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 this was an opportunity. And so thank you for for giving it. But no, yeah. I'm I'm very happy for for somebody to say oi. Um, that's my subject. Hands off, Dave. And I go, yeah, here, here you go. Um, I've got plenty yeah. to be going. So yes. Um, I mean, and very, and, very and, and David O'Keefe made there. a very good point earlier that 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 different. And let's not go too much into the religious, racial, but but that that breakdown is a is a summary of basically what was happening in Italy generally. With was it seventeen nations ended up taking part in the Battle of Monte Cassino over the two battles there. I mean, it was a theatre of co-opting people with yeah. different ideas and different ideologies and politics and backgrounds and doctrines and language 
and yeah. and standardization yeah. and equipment into one theater. Normandy is much more streamlined, for example, um, oh. as is the Rhineland campaign than, than Italy. Italy is a hodgepodge of all sorts of things all the way through it, um, which yeah. makes it fascinating. Yeah. Good. Well, yeah, I'm going to bring it, end it there, Gareth. So I'll just I'll just say uh, speak to the folks. I'll say goodbye to you in a second. So, folks, uh, tomorrow we have a show about the um, E Company One Four First Regiment, who are part of the Thirty Six Texas Division. I had my pre-show practice call with Dave Gutierrez this afternoon, and you're pleased to know the video and the internet connection audio that was absolutely perfect when we did the test. So hopefully it'll be it'll be good when we do. Um, the the show as well, and that would be really good. We're talking about the only Mexican unit within um, all Mexican within the U.S. Army and the 36th Texas. If you know anything about the Italian campaign, along with the American Third Division, they had some of the toughest fighting. We're talking Salerno, Anzio, Rapido River, all that stuff. There, so that'd be a really good show. And the great news: we'll be talking about the fact the, the movie rights have been sold to Dave's book about the uh, the men to us. That'd be a really good show tomorrow. Then the following day. Damien Lewis is coming on to talk about the SAS uh, operation uh, in the spring of 45. Then we have our discussion about the Italian Navy in World War II and some myths and things about that. Then finally, on Friday, Julian Whippy is joining us to talk about almost a two-hour battle within an hour-long show. We'll almost be doing it in real time. We're lo not looking at the whole of the Italian campaign. We're looking at one two-hour battle, which interesting, interestingly connects with what we're talking about tonight because we're talking about lorried infantry uh, of the Gurkhas. So lorried infantry is an extension of part of reconnaissance cavalry generally. So that would be interesting. So anyway, I'm going to say goodbye to Gareth now. Thanks thanks very much for joining us, Gareth. We'll do something again because I love talking to you. It just the fear of going down rabbit holes is always good, but you, your 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 enthusiasm and interest and, and humility to accept and admit that you don't know everything about the subject, I think is is good. There are lots of people who pretend that they know everything about everything, and none of us know everything about everything. We um we blag. I, I'm talking speaking about myself now. Yeah. So thanks for joining us, Gareth, and thanks for everybody watching. I thanks. will see everybody tomorrow. Uh, any final words, Gareth? No, nope, thank you very much. Good. Okay, then. We'll see you, folks. We'll see you all tomorrow. This is Paul Woodhead for World War Two TV saying I'll see you all again tomorrow. And don't forget, check out the links below. Check out Patreon. And um, thanks for joining us. See you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.